It is always a treat to connect with Anne Graham Lotz, President and CEO of Angel Ministries. Did you get the connection there? Anne Graham Lotz, Angel. Angel Ministries, and daughter of the most beloved evangelist of our times, Billy Graham, and his wife, Ruth Bell Graham, who is in heaven, my father's house. This is a delightful book. And, and we have a live audience here today, men and women, but I think the women especially are going to love that you say in your book, God was the first homemaker. <laughs> well, he was when he created Adam and Eve, and then he planted that garden eastward in Eden, and he was the one who prepared Eden to receive um, his first two children. So he was the first homemaker, yeah. So, and he's still preparing. You know, Jesus said, I'm going to heaven to prepare a place for you, and if I go, um, I'll come back and, and you'll be with me where I am. And I've, I've butchered that verse, but John 14, 1 to 3. He's still preparing a home for us. So. I'm sure it is ever more dear, uh, knowing that your mom is there already. Yeah. You know, I remember when uh, we were all standing around her bedside when she entered into heaven, and I was standing beside my daddy, and I saw her take her last breath and I said, Daddy, I said, Mother's in heaven. And, um, and she was. And at that moment, I was struck by the fact that eternity is just a breath away. Mm -hmm. And at that moment in time, nothing mattered. It didn't matter that she was a best-selling author, or that she had five children, or that she was Mrs. Billy Graham, or if she went to the White House, she always sat at the President's table because she's such a great conversationalist. And it didn't matter that she was born and raised in China and she was an authority on so many things. The only thing that mattered was that as a little girl, she had come by faith to the cross and confessed her sin and told God she was sorry and asked him to forgive her and claimed Jesus to be her savior and invited him to come into her heart and life. And at that moment, Myra, the only thing that mattered was her relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And so she was accepted in heaven for no other reason than she had been to the cross and, and had taken the hand that he offered her by faith. So. You know, it's, it just puts everything in perspective, doesn't it? Because we can just think we've got to accomplish this, we have to do that, or maybe we've done something bad and we think we're not worthy of whatever. It just All of that is just a never mind at that moment. The only thing that matters is that we've been to the cross and we've put our faith in Jesus. And so I have the wonderful confidence that one day, soon, I believe, uh, not because I'm getting ready to die, because I think Jesus is coming back, but I'm going to go to what I call our Father's house, and I'm going to see um, our Heavenly Father in Jesus, and I'm going to see my mother. Now, I'm going to use you, I'm going to use you, Anne, I'm telling you right now, to clarify something, and I hope that store owner is watching right now, who said, well, you can't know Jesus is real and that there is a heaven until you die. I said, are you kidding? I, just as I'm talking to you right now, I enjoy Jesus, mm -hmm. a relationship with him. That, I just watched the interview I did with your mom in 92 at Little Piney Cove, <laughs> your home yeah, where right. you grew up, yeah. and how sweet that you compare heaven to experiences in your home. Yeah. She enjoyed a rich relationship as you do now yeah. with a rare, very real living Lord Jesus Christ. That's right, that's right. And you know, when we talk about these, um, near-death experiences, and I think you've got some examples of that, or people who say they've died and they've gone to heaven and they come back and there's no judgment, there's just a bright light. And I think, you know, Jesus is the only one really who died and came back and told us that we need to put our faith in Him and claim Him as our Savior, um, that we might go to heaven. He's opened heaven for us and He's told us He's he gave his disciple John enough of a glimpse of what heaven is like, and that's at the end of our Bibles in Revelation chapter 21 and 22, gave him a glimpse of our heavenly home. It, it doesn't satisfy all of our curiosity, but it lets us know that we want to go. We, we want heaven to be our home, and we have to claim it by faith through Jesus. It's, it's something that is being prepared for us, but until we come to the cross and confess our sin and claim Jesus as our Savior and, and as what the Bible describes, being born again into His family, then heaven is not our home. You, you can't go there, but it's the, it's the spiritual birthright of all of God's children who've put their faith in Jesus. So the future has wonderful hope for us. Even if this whole world disintegrates, I know I'm going home. I think the last time you were here, we talked about this marvelous children's book. It's a poem 
all about heaven, yeah. God's promise for me. I did not realize that this is really the adult version. That's right. <laughs> that, that's right. And this was written for my grandchildren. This one actually was written because my father heard me speaking on heaven. He came to me afterwards and he, he couldn't get that off of his mind. He said, Ann, you need to write this down. So I wrote it down and he graciously did the foreword and, uh, and that became heaven, my father's house. But then in my heart, I wanted to reach little children because little children, they catch the news today or they see things happening and they get unsettled and they're afraid, but heaven is for them too. So I just wrote this story and it was um, after my, my mother had gone to heaven and I was trying to talk to my granddaughters about death and that's a difficult subject to handle with children. And so this, the story is about two little children, their granny died, they miss her, they want to know where she is and so they ask God and then he talks to them through the Bible and reveals to them what heaven is like. So I've taken what I've said here, but I've put them into a child's language, very fanciful and, and illustrations are wonderful. Beautiful and at the end, the, the little children kneel and pray and there's a prayer that they pray that a child can pray and ask Jesus to forgive them of their sin, come into their hearts that they can know one day they're going to heaven too. In fact, at the very back of the book, there's an invitation. That's there's right. an envelope in the back, the hard cover. It's a beautiful and so, design. Can you yeah, see you, the... you go into the hard, this little envelope and there's an invitation there where the child can fill it out and, and date it. Hard. Yeah, that they have received Christ and it's really for the, for the parent also to just record that their child has made that decision. But we have had so many children who have put their faith in Jesus as a result of this. So, so. Beautiful book, beautiful book. Summer's we need a, to pass it on to the next generation, Myron. Let me tell you something, we're losing the next generation. So well, this is my way of at least passing it on to little ones. You know, you know your mom read this book before she went to yes. heaven. But how timely is this? That, 9-11 was the inspiration, a catalyst uh, for actually putting, along with your dad, getting this on paper. You dedicated it to the dying and to all who are facing the future with a troubled heart. The world we're living in today, uh, it, it, all of those stressors have escalated and intensified. And I think it is causing people to look up this world is not a safe place. Yeah. When well, that's what Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You know, when you see these things happening, because in the world we do have tribulation, but he says, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. And so we want to keep our focus. And I want to be careful that when the world unravels, I don't unravel with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, while people around me are melting down and losing their hope, I want to be sure that I'm so steadfast in my faith and strong in my relationship with Jesus that I can help other people be strong in theirs. And so today when we see, you know, the majority of the refugees fleeing out of Syria into Jordan are children. There are over a million children that are fleeing into Jordan. And you think of mothers just uh, all over the world in Iraq trying to dodge the bombs with their little children or in Israel taking their children into bunkers because the bombs are coming in. And, and so they're, all over the world people are losing hope and feeling afraid. And bad things may happen in this life. I mean, we know that. J Jesus himself you know, would tell you that, that bad things may happen, but our hope is not in this life. Our, our hope is to come and our hope is in Jesus and our hope is in a heavenly home that's being prepared for us. And you say, it'll be just exactly what we hope yeah. for. I mean, summer's a big renovation time, isn't it? Yeah, People yeah. <laughs> fixing up their houses and doing those projects, but yeah. this is the ultimate. You know, uh, one of the illustrations I use for my children, they all went to school um, in another state, in, but clear across the country. And when I knew they were coming home, I began to prepare things for them so that when they walked through the door, they would know they were expected, they were welcomed, they had come home, they're, they're our children. And so uh, one of them liked barbecue spare ribs and a homemade apple pie, and so I would prepare those things so that when they walk in the door, they can smell it, they can and they know they've been expected and they're welcomed. And, and if I do that for my children, what is Jesus preparing for his children? And he knows the colors I enjoy and the people I want to be with and the scenery I want to look at and the music I enjoy. And, and he's preparing heaven, he said, just for me so that when I walk through heaven's gate, I will know I've been expected, I'm welcomed, I've come home because I'm the father's child. So it's very personal. I wrote yes. down three of your words, perfect, permanent, personal. Yes, that's right. What are you looking yeah. forward to the most in your future home, your true you know, home. To be honest, I'm looking forward to seeing Jesus. And, um, and after this long in life, I just feel that heaven will be wherever he is. And I want to see him, not only his face, but I want to see him when he sees my children and my grandchildren and um, the expression on his face. You know, I want to see him as my father walks in to heaven. And um, so there are little things like that that I'm looking forward to. As far as 
the, the, I want, I want so I'll tell you this, I want a place of service, and I believe that our reward in heaven, nobody knows for sure, but we're told to pursue our crown, don't let anybody take your crown, that, it's, that there's more to life than just being saved and getting into heaven and squeaking in the door. Peter said he wanted an abundant entrance, and, and I believe that God will reward us in heaven for a life that's been lived faithfully for him here, but the reward will not necessarily be crowns to lay at his feet, but perhaps opportunities to serve him and, uh, and show him that we love him through our service. And I, I would like a, a small position of service in heaven. I want to serve the king. Well, don't you believe that that's really what God's word indicates, that our, our, our service, uh, the use of our gifts here is all a preparation that's right. for eternal service. We're not floating around on a cloud <laughs> with a harp. Right. <laughs> I, I love what you say. Um, my, about the misconceptions, and there are plenty of them. My father's house is real. It is not an abstract idea, or a small child's fantasy, or an artist's concept of celestial beauty, or a musician's theme for a symphony, or a fearful person's imaginative escape from harm. Yeah, that's right. We need to get back to the Word of God. But we, and, the, and you know what? Something the Word of God says in Revelation 21, there is no more pain. There's no more suffering. There's no more tears. Not so even I the just, memory of a bad experience. That's right. And I, but I just put those in applications. So my father has macular degeneration. No more blindness. My mother had degenerative arthritis. No more lameness. Uh, my daughter has migraine headaches. No more migraines. Um, you know, my husband has adult one diabetes that's blown up in his face, so he's in renal failure. And uh, no, no more diabetes. No more dialysis. No more wheelchairs. No more crutches. No more bombs, no more wars, no more um, hidden agendas. No, you know, heaven is a place where one day we're going to go. And if we've been persecuted here for Jesus' sake, or we've been suffering, or we've been in poverty, or we've just had bad things happen to us, he's going to take us and wipe the tears from our face and say, you're home. There's, there's no more suffering, no more pain. You don't have to be afraid again. No more drive-by shootings, no more things that happen to us in the middle of the night. No. No more separation from those that we love who've died in Christ. We're, you know, it's a, so heaven is going to be not only a place of service, but a place of love and warmth and security. It, has, it says that there are high walls. The, the walls are 200 feet thick that John describes. And I don't know if they're real or not, but it just means to me heaven is a safe place. Nobody's going to hurt me inside those walls. <laughs> and spacious, as large as yeah. Canada to Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean to the Rockies, yeah. 1,500 miles square. Square and up as what? Well, it's a cube. And th those are the measurements given. Now, whether they're literal or not, nobody knows. But it's telling us it's a great big place and there's room for everybody. So you can invite anybody you want to come. And it's not going to be overcrowded. We're all going to have plenty of space in heaven. Oh, it's just so... Uh, let me give you one more characteristic that I love. My, uh, the streets of gold, which I think are just show, sometimes our priority is wrong because we treasure gold so much that we sacrifice our families to get more of it. And um, but up there, it's just asphalt. walking on it. Yeah, walking on it. Yeah, but the, the one that most precious characteristic to me are the gates. There are 12 gates. Each one is a single pearl. And a pearl is formed when a grain of sand or something gets inside an oyster and irritates it. And so he continues to cover that irritation with a layer of mother of pearl until he doesn't feel the irritation anymore. So if you have gates made out of pearls that are big enough to hang in walls that are 200 feet thick, that shows gigantic suffering on the part of that oyster, mm -hmm. which I think points to um, the cross. And the fact people say you don't need the cross to get to heaven, we all have our own guards and we can get in our own way. And, and I think the gates themselves tell us that the only way you can enter into heaven is through the blood of Jesus Christ, through his suffering, through his death. And that it's because Jesus died, heaven's gates are open for us. So every time we pass through those pearly gates, we're going to be reminded of what it cost Jesus in order to open them wide for us. And you think he's coming pretty soon. I think he's coming very soon. That's a whole other subject. Uh, well, <laughs> I'd love to talk to you about that. <laughs> I've got witnesses here. Please come back. I'd love to come Should back. Should the Lord Thank tarry, <laughs> come on back. And whatever your age or life circumstances, uh, if you belong to Jesus, you're part of God's forever family. And you can be glad for all God is planning for you. As the Apostle Paul says in Romans 12, 12, your anticipation is going to be enhanced with every chapter of heaven my father's house. Anne, thank you so much. Thank you. Love being Hope to see you again you. soon.